Support for this podcast comes from the patrons at patreon.com slash fmlfpl. Okay, welcome to another FML Field Fireside Chat. This is Alon. I'm joined by Anthony DeBundo from the Action Network and the Wonder Goal Soccer Gambling Podcast. How are you doing, Anthony? Doing well. Enjoying the off-season, but yeah. realizing quickly there's not much time left until we've got <laughs> oh, games no. again. Oh, no, man. The FPL Fantasy Premier League opened yesterday, like the, the game, so... This is peak season for us. This is like everyone freaking out, foaming at the mouth for content and stuff. Um, when do you start sort of looking at, you know, futures and, and lines? When do you start your research on teams and players and transfers and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so, you know, it, it depends on the year. And I think this year there's less turnover than normal with regards to managers. And I think that's mm. usually the biggest kind of hurdle to clear is, okay, you know, this team had this manager. They're going to have a new manager. How may that? How will they change? How will that affect them? Do I do I want to you know all of a sudden like them more or less? And this year, none of the big teams except for Man United, who basically didn't have a manager at the end of last year, changed managers. Yeah. And so there's less turnover there. Of course, there's been a lot of buying and selling of players, and that kind of is ongoing. So you kind of have to factor that in. You know, a team like Newcastle is really hard to price right now because you don't yeah. know if they're going to go make a big splash, but. Overall, I think it's kind of just an ongoing process. I don't look at anything for about three weeks after the season ends, maybe a month. So I didn't even open my spreadsheets or anything. Of course, I'm following transfer news, but not really paying attention. And then now that once the calendar hits July, we've got an August 5th start date for for Europe. I'm going to be kind of going. So almost almost every day now, looking through some stuff, updating, uh, getting ready to go for the nice. next year. So this is sort of kicking off your schedule. I like that. Um, just a little bit about you and your background. How how'd you get into soccer? I mean, you know, we're both American. I think it's a little bit abnormal. It's still sort of like a niche sport that a lot of people don't follow. And then obviously found yourself, you know, writing, doing podcasts about soccer, gambling on soccer. Tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, so I never played. I played when I was like five and yeah. I was that kid. <laughs> on the soft on the soccer field who like stood in the corner and like didn't really want to get involved and <laughs> yeah. I, I played baseball and tennis growing up so I, i've never loved soccer as a player uh but i've always kind of enjoyed watching it and then i'd say probably the 2010 world cup is when i got into it and then i decided okay i'm gonna you know start getting in the club more and and so really since i'd say 11 12 uh you know bale and spurs were the first love and that's oh, how man. i got in as a fan and then started betting it pretty regularly 2016 17 18 so now uh you know i'm i'm doing this you know full time and uh i started with the action network in spring of 2020 right when the pandemic started was oh, when i started God. so i got hired and then there was no soccer for a few <laughs> months but but then the bundesliga came back and it was just us so oh, yeah. we had a kind of our moment in the sun and then you know the restart and now with the euros you know, and then of course now the World Cup coming up. We're hoping to get bigger audiences to get more people sucked into the to the to joys of soccer. Yeah, really no, absolutely. But so how do you how do you transition your following Spurs and Bale and whatnot? Because you know, obviously Bale was like God back then. How do you translate that into gambling? Were you always gambling on sports, or did you just start on soccer? And you know, how, how'd that happen? Yeah, I've, I've been betting you know NFL and I'd say college hoops for for years prior yeah. to that. And that was the first two sports that I really got into. But then I kind of found a niche and an enjoyment in, in betting soccer. And, you know, I think there's something for the fact that it's not as widely popular in America. And thus, you know, some of the lines can be off or perhaps you can find an edge there. And uh, I enjoy it. It's something that I think has a market in America because of its time slot, right? Like nobody's yeah. going to watch soccer if they're playing at three on the afternoon on Sundays. But most of the games are on in the morning. Yeah. or weekday afternoons. And so you've got a good window where there aren't a lot of competing sports on to really dominate the market. It's just kind of getting to that point, but I think we're getting there. Yeah. So for me, it, it was, I was gambling on other sports and then fell in love with soccer and, and betting on it. I, I don't know the best way to word this, but you know, soccer compared to, you know, the other major American sports has by far the fewest like events or like goals or, you know, touchdown equivalent to, mm -hmm. to the major American sports. Like, does that make it easier to bet or does that make it more difficult or is that not even a factor? Uh, it definitely increases the variance. You know, yeah. it's not basketball where you're getting a hundred possessions a game. It's not yeah. 
uh, or a hundred baskets or scores a game, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, it's not even to a lesser extent football where you know, sometimes the ball just bounces weird. The, in soccer, I mean, it's one or two moments sometimes that decide games and, and you have to be able, you know, to use stuff like expected goals and people kind of scoff at it sometimes and, you know, <laughs> but in the long run, you know, we, we try to be right more than we're wrong and nobody's going to be right 100% of the time. Nobody's going to be right 70% of the time. Right. But if I can be right 55, 56% of the time and that little edge is really all the difference and I think because soccer is the way it is, you'll get super inflated totals on teams that are running really hot or you'll get super deflated totals on teams that are running cold with finishing and and you know finishing is definitely a, a big part of what you guys do with with fbl yeah, and of course for, sure. for me with with betting and sometimes you just you're just going to watch a game and the team's going to have 12 shots from inside the 10 you know inside 10 yards and they're going to miss all of them and you're going to lose your bet and you just say ah you got to move on to the next one. you made a good pick <laughs> nice try um yeah. <clears throat> on that note who who sort of taught you the ropes of gambling like was it were they books or tools or websites or something like that for someone who's new to gambling or just an amateur like me? Like, how do you learn that stuff? Like, sort of your fifty six percent, and how do you convert? You know, what you think will happen, which is basically where amateur betting lies with, it, with like me. I'm like, yeah, this guy will probably score, but how do I actually convert that to like something I want to bet? Like, where do I find the value in a line? You know what I mean? Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to do that. And there, there's there's certain principles that kind of root yourself in gambling, stuff like buying low on teams or, or selling high, uh, going against you know the prevailing sentiment, being a contrarian by nature. I think all of those things are general kind of basic stuff that good bettors tend to possess or tend to look for those certain situational spots or whatnot. Uh, and it really just comes with experience. You know, I'm constantly learning myself. And I tell people this all the time. I started betting soccer. I didn't have a model. I wasn't projecting yeah. lines. And I was kind of doing what you said, you know, going off of feel and, and kind of watching games and amassing some data. You know, it was it was informed data, educated guesses in a way, right? Yeah, and, yeah. You know, as I've kind of worked on it, and really it was the pandemic, I had some time where there wasn't soccer and I, nobody was doing anything, yeah. uh, where I was like, okay, I want to sit down and really develop something that I can trust, that I can use kind of project lines. And so I base everything off of expected goals, almost everything off of expected goals and my numbers and other stuff like squad value goes into it. And uh, goals do count toward it. People, somebody asked me that the other day, like, <laughs> do you even count goals? And I, I do, but <laughs> expected goals are counted heavier for me uh, because they're more predictive. And so, uh, you know, you just develop your own kind of numbers sense and then you just get a feel yeah. for when the market is wrong on a certain team. And I, that happens a lot. I mean, we've talked, if you've listened to our podcast, Wonder Goal, you know, yep. like Brighton, like we bet on Brighton so much in the last two years, it's not even funny. And they finally yeah. started cashing for us. Uh, and, and Crystal Palace, mm -hmm. you know, when they were home underdogs this year, cash cow. So the, yeah, there's various yeah, yeah. teams that, that kind of, you know, you just you pick up on. Awesome. Yeah, I want to kind of just jump, if it's cool, to let's just talk about some Premier League futures. And I think it'll spark like different questions I have and different tangents and conversations and stuff like that. So I guess first question is like, when is the right time to start betting futures? Like, I don't know how lines move and, you know, like you said, there's still transfers happening, all this stuff. Like, I see numbers now and I just, I bet. I don't really consider, like, this is a good time to bet Liverpool, whatever, you know, whatever you're betting. How do you feel about that? I mean, the, it's hard to say in the offseason. Yeah. I mean, yeah. unless you're unless you're Fabrizio Romano mm -hmm. and you know when the moves <laughs> are going to be made, you know, we're kind of just at the behest of the news. And if you can, if you have sources or something and you can work those or you have inklings that, you know, a team is making a move for a certain player. And, you know, I know people through Spurs that, that kind of will tip me off about stuff as a fan, you know, yeah. I want to know, but I don't have that kind of connection for all these teams. So I don't know that, you know, Newcastle is going to move for Botman before they do. Or yeah, that, yeah. You know, everybody kind of knew City was swooping in for Holland. And so that's kind of just priced in at this point. But I, I don't, people, people ask me that all the time. I don't think there's a bad time to move on these markets. Now, if you were asking me for World Cup, I think it's a little different because they're going to play a lot of matches before that. Right. Injuries kind of factor in there. But as far as the Prem, you know, the season's going to start in a month. Everybody who's healthy now is probably going to be healthy for then. There may be a few other signings, but odds are, generally speaking, we know kind of what the teams are going to look like. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. think there's a ton of players left on the market that are going to truly move in terms of the Prem. You know, Lewandowski moving to Barca, maybe uh, Sterling to Chelsea could move the needle a lot. 
But otherwise, there's not like a lot of players. Like, you know, are Spurs signing, you know, Spence from Middlesbrough going to move yeah. the market? No. Yeah, like that, you right. know, so I think there's not that many players. And you'll see teams get overhyped off of big summer transfer windows. And that kind of happened with Chelsea last year, right? They went out two years ago. They went out and spent a ton of money. Mm. But the manager stunk, right? And so yeah. I, you know, I made good money fading Chelsea early in the season. Uh, and then Tuchel came in and, and was a good manager, kind of changed the system and whatnot. Uh, and even then now, you know, you're looking at Chelsea, you're like, where's this? You know, they're, they're kind of Their squad is really bit. weird. We'll, we'll get to Chelsea in the top yeah. four bets because I have thoughts on so, that. But, you know, <laughs> kind of like the bottom line is there's no wrong time. I don't think yeah. for the Prem. And okay. I think that, you know, if you see an, if you see a bet you like, if you want to bet Liverpool to win the league right now, I don't have a problem with it. I wouldn't personally because I, I think City's going to win it again. But uh, and the number's kind of not really there for Liverpool. But, uh, it, you know, there's no wrong time necessarily. Right. Well, so let's just start on that. Just the titles. And Man City, on my app at least, you know, man, I'm going to do American odds. Sorry for all the European listeners. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know fractional and decimals. I'm just speaking American odds here. But Man City on my app is is minus 165 to repeat. Liverpool plus 250. What would be the number that makes Liverpool worth it? You know what I mean? Are you just straight up translating those to probabilities and you're just saying like on my numbers they're blah 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 likely to win the title so this number's not good enough yeah you know the thing about liverpool last year is that they were as good as man city absolutely and yeah if if city had not signed erling holland i would have bet liverpool at plus 250 but i think the the addition of holland and the addition of calvin phillips moves yeah. the needle to the point now where the number is about right for me if liverpool got to four to one I would take a shot on Liverpool. The thing with the, the Liverpool is that they finally have some depth, and this was the biggest problem yeah. for the first couple of years. You know, they ran really well with injuries in that title-winning campaign. Nobody got hurt. And then, kind of paid for it, right? They got all yeah. the injuries. Everyone, that, this, yeah. The season after that, like, everybody got hurt. And they quietly added a ton of depth. They now have, like, five solid central midfielders. Curtis Jones coming through. Keita is solid. Of course, Henderson and Tiago finally yeah. stayed healthy, and so Fabinho. And Fabinho, of course, right. So they they added midfield depth, but also they had finally trusted guys behind Firmino, Mane, and Salah. Yeah, right. They went out and got yep. Jota, and I think that makes a huge difference. And Luis Diaz now, and they're cycling through. So Mane's gone, Firmino's on his last legs, but it's going to be Jota, Nunez. Yep. Right. So they have the talent now to, I think, yep. compete with City, but. I do think City's overall level is is considerably higher now that they add Holland because even if he only plays 25 games, which is about what I'd expect from him because I do expect him to consistently have injury issues just the way he That's is how built. he is, yeah. Yeah, and uh, even if he only plays 25 games, the numbers he put up in the Bundesliga suggest that he's going to be able to wreck the Prem uh, and, and get over a half a goal per game. And so I think he's yeah. a 20-goal-a-year guy if he plays 30 games. So even if you can 15, 20 goals... Right that was the biggest hole in the city team. And the <laughs> yeah. second hole was midfield depth. They didn't have a lot of it. You know, it was kind of just Rodri and Fernandinho's done now. So they added Calvin Phillips, who I think is the second best midfielder, maybe third best midfielder in the Prem right now in terms of, wow. you know, defensive, defensive, defensive okay, midfielder, okay, I should okay, say. Okay. Yeah, no, don't want to disrespect the Brun. Yeah, uh, second like, or third damn, best. dude, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, second or third best defensive midfielder. I put him right up there with Declan Rice. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, in Golo Conte of Golo Conte's of the world. And I think that, you know, kind of that crew, you know, now you have Rodri and Phillips, you have cover for those positions. You're still going to have De Bruyne, you know, and, and Gunduan's getting good minutes. So, and Foden's going to develop. And so I think City's just deeper and better. And uh, over 38 games, I think they're still the right favorites. I was hoping to get plus money. I would have, I would have bet that. Yeah, uh, but maybe so, maybe they'll start slow. They do have a little bit of a tendency to do that. I could that see that, you know, Holland betting in and whatnot. But I was going to follow up with what you said because you said you you would bet Liverpool if they're four to one. So like, what makes four to one a good bet versus you know plus two fifty? You know, I'm just like math wise, like why is that your number? Like why is that the line that you that you would bet Liverpool? Yeah, so we can we can kind of project that out and use a kind of like a simulation based thing. How yeah. strong do we think Liverpool is relative to the rest of the league? Of course, with scheduling, it's always easier to do it this way because everybody plays everybody twice. So you don't yeah, have yeah. to control for strength of schedule, uh, and you can kind of say, okay, if I think Liverpool is 0.8 goals per ninety better, expected goals per ninety better than their opponents this season, we can project how many points will they get. How many, uh, you know, points will City get? And you can kind of do that and then create, you know, run some simulations, have somebody help me with the math on that. 
uh, to kind of <laughs> figure out a number of which, you know, what percent of the time does Liverpool win the league? And so if you think Liverpool wins the league 25% of the time, that's, that's the equivalent of plus 300. And yeah. so if you say, okay, I think Liverpool is going to win the league 25% of the time. Well, at plus 250, you're betting negative EV. But if they get up to plus 400, that's only about 20%. And so then I would look to bet Liverpool. And so that's what, really kind of the back the e- and forth. What is the EV? Uh, expected value. So if I think something's going to happen 25% of the time, and the odds say, it's act, you know, the odds are going to give me 20%. Yeah. So like plus 400, for example, yeah. is 20%. I will bet Liverpool yeah. because I think my, the real chance of it happening is better than the odds that they're giving me. And that's kind of right, right, what right, we're doing right. here, right? And yeah, yeah. so with City, I do think they win the league more than half the time. But I don't think they win it enough for minus 160 to be of value, especially in a market like this, because you're essentially giving the sports book your money for eight, nine months. I know. Uh, and, and for a minus 160 payoff, it's very hard for me to sit there and go, oh, I, you know, nine months later, woo, I won my minus 160 <laughs> bet that I made in September. I mean, you might as well, you know, put it in the stock market and it'll Seriously. probably go up by more than that at that point. So, uh, yeah, I don't really love, you know, laying minus 160 on a on a title future when fair you enough. have to wait nine months. Yeah, yeah, it's fair. It's like I love futures and hate futures for the same reason, though. You know, it's fun oh, yeah. to have action all season and be like, I'm in on this, you know, especially like player futures and goal totals and stuff like that. But yeah, it's I understand the other side of it. Let's uh, let's talk about Golden Boot. I mean, that's a big one. And I was surprised to see Holland as like a big favorite. In this, um, you know, with his injury history, new team, you know, rotation, Pep, blah, blah, blah. blah. He's, he's at plus 330 on my app. Kane and Mo are next, you know, plus 500 each. And then, you know, it's a wide, wide open field after that, pretty much. Um, you think, do you agree Holland should be the favorite? I mean, to me, Salah should just obviously be the favorite. I agree. Yeah. I think he he's always on penalties. Yeah. Not that Holland won't be on penalties, but I think there's a chance that Berna take some penalties from him or even Mares take some penalties from him if he's still right. at the club, which I expect him to be. Uh, and so I'm, uh, you know, I'm always hesitant with golden boot markets just because of the injuries too, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, if you had Sonny last year, that's awesome. I mean, that's <laughs> an incredible call. I mean, he is not on pens and he got there, but you know, ultimately Holland with the injury history, there's a big concern there. And I really don't yeah. want any part of Erling. Uh, and I think so for me, I don't love guys who just come into the Prem, especially Holland. I know I just sung his praises, but the Bundesliga, the defending there is significantly oh it's more God. open. The defenders yeah. are worse. It's bad. You know, I bet the Bundesliga every weekend. I watch it. I love it. But, uh, you know, it's a big difference. And the same for Portugal with Nunez. Uh, if you're looking down the market, you know, maybe you could, you could maybe sell me on a Gabby Jesus, but oh, I would need like I would, I, would I, need, going. I would need more. I would need more than that. I was that. hoping and, you were gonna say Vardy plus twenty five hundred. Yeah, I think Talk Vardy's kind of done. Vardy, why? What his what numbers, makes you his think his numbers he's have done? just kind of been declining? You know, I could pull it up. Um, yeah, I think last season he was still you know firing. Um, you know, when he was fit, he was only fit at the beginning and the end of the season, but he was putting up you know I think second best goal per ninety behind Mo. I'm not sure if the XG backed it up or not, but you know I just don't. I pretty much refuse to take any player who's not on pens. You know, obviously Sun came through last season, but it's just so many free goals that it just seems ridiculous to bet that. And, you know, I see Vardy at plus 2,500. I'm like, I don't know. You know, again, that's a, that's that's me being an amateur and just being like, in my head, I'm like, yeah, I could see that happening. I kind of like that as an outsider chance, but I don't actually have any way to quantify it and be like, this is a good number to bet. This happens through over 3.8% of the time in a simulated season. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. I think the interesting thing is for Jesus and the reason that I think he could have value, but probably doesn't at 14. If you got like 20 plus, then I'd be intrigued yeah. is because it's always been finishing for him. Right. And if yeah. you look at his XG numbers, they're incredible. I mean, I am extremely high on on the addition of jesus to the team i think that, that and and i'm no arsenal fan uh you know my co my co-host I, bj cunningham is probably see, like yeah he wonders what's wrong with me when i say that but i see the white uh, heart lane thing you know yes about yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, right yeah about me so you know jesus does everything you'd want in a modern centered forward he links to play really well uh he's very effective uh getting in behind 
the biggest question is the finishing. He's underperformed XG every single year. Yeah. And now he's old enough at the point where we can't just say it's a small sample, he'll regress. Because there are plenty of players who will finish well above XG one year, yeah. well below next year, then they're even, you know, they'll run up. There's variance. But when you're yeah. consistently below, I think you run past the point of, okay, this guy's a good finisher. He's probably just a mediocre one who's run poorly. So with that being said, there is a chance. I mean, if he had just an okay finishing year, he's going to play almost every game. He's been very durable. Right. You know, right. He hasn't had a ton of injuries. He's had a lot of like falling out of favor or, yeah, yeah. you know, play it, play it out of position him. a lot too. The city has so many good attackers. Yeah, and he doesn't yeah. play that much, uh, but I like Jesus in that system for Arsenal. I think he, he kind of fits well into what Arteta wants. And that would be the one play for me that I would maybe consider. But again, is he even on pens? Because I, I don't I, know. I don't Saka think so. He's he's really bad at them, so I think Saka will take <laughs> Exactly. Them. That's the other thing, right? <laughs> and somebody who's so bad at pens makes you think, okay, if he's really bad at pens, he's just not a good finisher. That's probably and, a good indicator that he's bad at kicking the ball in the net, yeah. Right, and that's kind of a problem when you have the golden boots. So if there was like a golden XG... I think oh I would, my I think God! Love, Golden I XG. Love, I would love Jesus at fourteen to one. Oh my uh, God! Golden think, non-penalty uh, XG per ninety. Now we're talking. Yeah. Now we're betting. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I I do have like a you know this isn't really a question for like this pod, but I do have a question about you know City's system making them look bad as finishers. Like if you just look at last season, for example, pretty much the entire team except De Bruyne is under their XG. Do I actually think they're all below average finishers? There's no way. They're like some of the best players in the world. I just feel like the types of chances or the quantity of chances or, you know, maybe it's just not the XG models themselves aren't reading City the right way or something like that. So there, there's a little bit of that in my, you know, in my thinking with Jesus. But yeah, like you said, he just needs to sort of get lucky one year and just be five over his XG and all of a sudden, you know, he's, he's in contention. So, Yeah, I mean, it's funny because De Bruyne had a stretch a couple of years ago where he couldn't finish. He oh, had like yeah. seven XG and then we had one goal and it was like, Insane. oh, well, you know, I mean, nobody would ever watch soccer and say, De Bruyne is a bad finisher. Yeah. But right. like, obviously he's not, but you know, sometimes variance happens and you have a bad run. Uh, the City thing is interesting because th that, that seems to be the narrative, right? The narrative is they don't have a true striker. That's why they always underperform XG. Well, now we're going to get a test, right? Because yes, Holland has been an, a dynamo finisher relative to XG in his career. He's only 22. But you, know, you look at that and you're like, oh, so now we have the unstoppable force meeting yeah. the movable. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens with the, the narratives. If you know, Holland goes into a finishing slump, yeah. which probably will happen at some point, then what's the narrative going to be? Yeah, that he's exactly. not ready for the prem, or you know, Pep is too big Pep brain is, for XG. Yeah, you know, he's yeah, just, he's, he's not ready for it. So I'm interested to see what happens there with with that. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay, let's talk about top four. I mean, your Spurs are minus one thirty five on my app, and I I love that. I think Spurs right now are probably the third best team in the country. So you know, minus one thirty five, close to even for top four. I'm I'm in on that, but. I did see Chelsea at minus 150, a little bit more favored to be top four. And, you know, we mentioned Chelsea in passing, but like there's so much changeover. They're losing a bunch of their players. You know, their midfielders are getting older. I'm just not really sure. Like, I don't feel that great about Chelsea being like secured as a top four team. Am I crazy? I, I agree. Uh, and, you know, I think the interesting thing with Chelsea is going to be kind of the narrative, right? Because what happened in the first half of last season yeah. was that Chelsea was good. I mean, they were clearly the third best team. Yeah. But they ran really well defensively and in attack. Their finishing numbers were off the charts. And so they were playing up with City and Liverpool in the points. Yeah. Despite the underlying numbers always kind of saying like, eh, they're just not quite on that level. Yeah, yeah. And what happened in the second half of the season is the performances got marginally worse, but not, they were still the third best team. But the finishing got worse, right? So yeah. they ran a little cold, and so they fell down. I mean, at one point, we were, we had a conversation on Wonder Goal, you know, how safe is Chelsea's lead in the top four? Ended up being fine. But there was a there was a stretch where you were like, man, like this might get ugly for Chelsea. Yeah, they just can't find points right now. Right. And, you know, the Lukaku saga is out of the way, which I think is good. But where are all the goals coming for this Chelsea team right now? I and know. that's the biggest question mark. If they don't sign Sterling, I, I don't know where all these go. I like Mount. I love Kai Havertz. Werner, I'm not giving up on him, but 
there's not a lot of goals when you compare them to the two teams that I think are making the push up the ladder to go after them. And so I, I want no part of Chelsea top four. I do think they'll finish in the top four uh, more likely than not. But again, minus 150, you have to lay, you're, you're looking over 60% of the time. And I, I don't, don't like think, that. I don't think at all that, you're, you know, Chelsea makes top four 60% of the time. And I think you're going to hear a lot of conversation about Spurs and Arsenal challenging for that top two or Chelsea. I really don't see it. I still think there's a huge, huge gap between City and Liverpool, who for my money are the two best teams in the world, uh, compared to Chelsea, Arsenal, Spurs, who are very good, but not yeah. on the level. And I think a lot of people want to you know, create some controversy. They want somebody other than City Liverpool to make that run. That may happen early in the season. You may see yeah. Arsenal run hot or Chelsea or Spurs. But I think by 38 games, you're going to see that there's a clear distinction between the two and then three, four, five. And then I think there's a drop off to six even with Ten Hag coming in. Yeah, and you mentioned the goals, and then the other thing is, right, you just look at the back, the back line. I mean, Rudiger, 3,000 minutes for them, gone. Thiago Silva turns 38 in like a month or something like that. He's He has to play every game now. You know, Jorginho played 2,200 minutes. He's getting older and slower. And Conte could only play 1,700 minutes. He's getting older and more injury-prone every year and slower. You know, Christensen plays 1,500 minutes, gone. You know, I'm just like... Man, they need a they need to sign some guys. <laughs> like they need Sterling, but they also need a center back. <laughs> yeah, and the the thing about it, and this is this is the one thing. Like Jules Kounde was linked. Yep, I'm kind of mad on him overall. Uh, the question is, can the Tuchel system overcome the issues with center back personnel? Right, right. And I right, think right, a lot right. of people don't really think that Tony Rudiger was a top five center back when people were saying that. Uh, you know, if you took him out of the Chelsea team, same thing with Christensen, who, when he was forced to defend in space, got rinsed frequently, but yeah. wasn't asked to do it a lot. So you can kind of hide a little bit. You know, Chalaba is okay, maybe, but you know, they're, again, mm. you're right. Like they're asking a lot of yeah. inexperienced center backs, and we don't know who they're going to line up. And and the thing is, and you mentioned this earlier, the Conte Kovacic midfield is older now. And yeah. Conte, if you look at his numbers, and FE Ref is not loading for me, which is terrible time. Me neither. To this Nightmare. Podcast, I've been the site freaking is down. out. <laughs> but I know because I looked at it yesterday. I don't have the exact numbers offhand, but Conte's numbers took a drop off last yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, big time. And in terms He's of tackles, more of a passer now, which is weird. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of what happens on the age curve, right? Players do less ball winning. They do more passing when they get older. But they need his ball winning. And if they yeah. don't have that, that's a problem. Then they do have good pressers from the front. Pulisic, uh, Havertz is an excellent mount. Now, is good. But that midfield duo doesn't have a lot of ball winning now. Right. With Kovacic and, being more of a ball carrier and Conte doing less. So there's definitely a hole there. A hole that I thought they'd fill with Declan Rice. And if they yeah. filled it with Declan Rice, yeah. I'd, I'd say you know Chelsea's the third best team in the league. They really but needed to. I, I don't feel like they are. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. I mean, yeah, Jorginho, I mean... Like every player gets slower and older and less agile over time, but when you're already really slow and unagile and get destroyed in space, it, it's like amplified, you know? So I just, he and Conte keeps getting injured. Like if they're expecting just 2,500 Jorginho minutes, I'm like, I, I, I don't know, man. But um, yeah, and the, the interesting thing is, you know, if you go by just the new year, so from yeah. December 31st until June, yeah. May. Uh, Spurs were better than Chelsea. Mark, yeah, absolutely. Uh, by XG, yeah. Arsenal were a little bit behind Chelsea. Uh, they were. I had Arsenal plus eleven in nineteen games, so a little over plus a half per game. Chelsea were plus fourteen in eighteen games, so a little bit closer to three quarters. Yeah. So you're you're talking about a quarter goal difference between Chelsea and Arsenal, and I don't think you can make an argument that, that Arsenal got better this year in the in the off season, and that Chelsea definitely didn't get better, probably got worse as of now. Ars so, Arsenal, I would say, got better. You you don't think so? Oh, I do. Oh, I don't oh think Chelsea sorry, did. I, I misheard you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and Spurs are also getting better. You know, and they they only had half a season of Conte, and now you know they get a full off season. They buy some players. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, we're 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 neck and neck. I mean, not neck and neck. Me and you are aligned on that one. But uh, let's go down the table a little bit more. So top six. I see Arsenal at minus 200. I'm interested. I see West Ham at plus 350. I'm interested. And then I see, like, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just 
too in on Leicester right now with my Vardy golden boot, you know, long shot, but Leicester's plus 500 in the top six. They're also minus 150 in the top 10. Like they're not in Europe this season. Everyone's fit coming into the season. I'm, am I too high on Leicester? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I just, it just feels like the, the Rogers experiment has run its course a bit and they're probably yeah. going to lose Tielemans. And then you start looking around and you're like, all right, who's left of this team that, that you know, was so effective Yeah. Uh, back in the, and, and really, I, I do think a lot of it comes down to Vardy because when he, but you're right, when he was fit, they were scoring a lot of goals, Yep. but that defense was so bad. I mean, the second half of the season, only Norwich conceded more expected goals. <laughs> it's not great. And so, you know, what we, we say like, oh, they have these players who we kind of like, but the system very clearly wasn't working. Yeah. And I think. And this is, this is, I, I haven't seen markets for this, but I will be looking to invest in first manager fired Brendan Rogers. Cause yeah. I, 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 do, I do think th- th- there are two scenarios and I think there's a possibility that, you know, Lester was consistently a top eight, nine team. They had a very weird year where everything kind of went wrong. You mentioned the injuries early and then Vardy yep. was not himself for most of the year, wasn't healthy. So there is a chance that we're just overreacting to one year yeah, yeah. and they snap back. And they snapped back to being a, you know, eighth, ninth place team, which ended up, you know, ended up being where they finished, but they really weren't. Um, but I think there's also the possibility that things just stay really bad and that they just move on. And they say, look, Rogers did good things it's here. It's not working. But it's not working. And if you look down the list, I mean, who else is on the verge of getting fired? You know, and I think, well, you know, I, do, I do want to get there. Yeah. Uh, I don't Hassan have would be the other name that app. came up for me. Yeah. Yeah. Marsh is always in danger just because yes. of his nationality, right? And because it's Leeds. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think if you look down the board, I mean, nobody well, in the top half. Lodge. I think. I yeah, think I he, don't see Lodge going though. He's, but if he's, they're just that bad again, right. you know, they just have a slow start. They can't score goals. They're just they a nightmare to watch. Half. Yeah, they did. They did. And, and all and of that I was on Saad's shoulders, buys you know? Time? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. But, you know, if Saad just comes out and is average and they're just losing <laughs> right. every game and they can't score, I mean, how much longer will they persist? I, I don't really know there. But, yeah, I mean, the, my devil's advocate case for Leicester is exactly what you said, basically, right? It's like, well, they didn't have Fafana. They didn't have Justin. They didn't have Pereira. You know, they Evans missed time. You've already missed a ton of time. I've already played at 1,800 minutes. And, you know, I'm looking on, like, under stack because FBRF is down, but... You know, his non-penalty XG per 90 on understat was still 0.5. Like, that is that is better than 2020. It's better than 2019. It's the same as 2018. Like, when he played, he was still balling out and scoring a lot of goals. He scored 15 goals in 1,800 minutes. Um, so, you know, uh, that's my case for them, but I totally get it. And I'm not a huge Rodgers guy. I just think also being out of Europe really helps them. I think like yeah. they they yeah. were doing a bad job like balancing the squad, you know, between the Thursday games and the Sunday games. I think that's definitely a fair point. The other interesting thing was set pieces, right? This was not a big issue for them yeah. in the past years. Yeah. I mean, it just became one. Yeah. I don't know. I'd have to go deeper into it, like the stickiness of set piece issues that just pop up seemingly out of nowhere. Another reason where you'd be like, okay, they're probably not going to be that bad on set pieces again. <laughs> But maybe they are. But maybe and, they are. And, maybe they. And, but, maybe Rogers just doesn't focus on it. Yeah. Yeah, and and something's missing there. I don't know, but they conceded more goals from set pieces than anybody but Leeds last year, uh, and that's because Leeds conceded a ton of them. So you look at it and you're like, okay, well, if they don't fix the set piece issue. That's the kind of thing where if I'm yeah. manager, if I'm management, upper management, and I'm like, okay, we knew we had this problem, we couldn't fix it. Uh, what are we doing here? And yeah. and so. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm selling Leicester. Again, you know, they finished the season second half. They were even on goal difference, but they were minus 10 XG difference, you know, pulling it up from understat in the last yeah. 20 games. So yeah. they were bad. I mean, minus I guess, I guess I'm buying is low. like <laughs> teetering on relegation level. And you are. Yeah. That's yeah. a good point. You're buying yeah. low here. Yeah. Uh, I'm more hesitant to do that because I do think uh, yeah. the market's kind of pricing them as the eighth or ninth team. And I'm like, eh. Very fair. Uh, yeah. I think it's well, more likely well, they're not. The top 10 lines are, are just, you know, top half of the table lines. I think there's a lot of teams that I like here. Um, I think minus 150 for West Ham in the top half is really nice. I think Villa's at minus 125 and aforementioned Brighton's even money. Palace plus 250. I'm like interested in all of those. You know, I mean, obviously there's not that much room in the top half of the table. There's probably four, four slots that aren't 
guaranteed to be taken there. But, you know, I think that there's a pretty good case that those are the next four teams right there. I mean, Newcastle's in the mix. Yeah, I think I'm selling some Brighton stock, you know, and this that that saying that sentence kind of hurts me, but they, yeah, they are getting they are getting raided. Uh, you know, they lose mm. Suma. They're looking like they're going to lose Kukurea. Yeah, true. So th- th- there's a lot of pieces leaving, and, and I haven't heard much from them on the front of like we're adding these good players. Please yeah. trust us. And uh, and so I think that you know Brighton kind of wasn't a top ten team. They were kind of like twelfth last year. I think I've got them ninth in my ratings, but. Uh, that that that's showing some weight from the prior season when they were legitimately a top six team. Just yeah, finish. yeah. Uh, and so I'm not too stoked on Brighton plus hundred. I think we're buying high there. Yeah. Because last year I had a plus one ninety ticket and we got to the window, but it was it was not a, an easy one. Uh, Villa, I'm definitely buying. Yeah. Because of the impressive defensive numbers that I saw from that team in the second half of the season. Once Gerard came in, the defense just immediately stopped conceding big scoring chances, and that is a sign to me that one, Jared knows what he's doing. And two, I then trust the attack enough, what they have from Watkins to even getting, you know, stuff from Jacob Ramsey. Uh, and so, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Emmy Buendia because he kind of hasn't done it that much in the Prem. You're hurting me. That, I love like him, that one but... half season at Norwich. Yeah. Uh, and and, uh, and FPL, I, I don't know as well. You know, yeah, maybe yeah, he's yeah. a really good buy low guy because he probably could be. But Coutinho, is staying right, and so that just opens up this team. I think that they have all kinds of potential to be a top ten team. So I think Villa would be the look there, and I agree yeah. with you on Palace. I think I think Villa and Palace are the two buy teams. Now Palace, we don't know the situation with Gahey and Gallagher at the moment. That's important uh, because well, you know, Gallagher I think is gone. I mean, unless they're dear, you know, quietly was talk, trying to get him back. Again, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, um, but Chelsea but Gahey, not let that Gahey is. Was permanent though. They bought okay. him last year. Yeah. So he's there. Right. So, you know, their, their defense is just good to go as far as I can tell, you know? And yeah. And that's another thing. I mean, that defense didn't concede chances. Mark and they're Gahey, young and they're Mark young. Gahey is uh, maybe a top five center back in the league. I, th- I think I would wow. say that. Wow. I think I would say that. Uh, I would put him over anybody at Spurs except Romero. Uh, I would put him over Ben White. Uh, probably not, obviously not over Virgil or, or even Ruben Diaz. But after that, I mean, you know, who are these elite center backs? You know, I don't know. United what the hell are Chelsea doing, by the way, <laughs> letting him go? Like, yeah, it was a mistake. And 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 Palace are definitely a buy for me yeah. at plus 250. What uh, about, you're not interested in West Ham top 10? You're telling me this team's not going to finish at top half of the table? I'm worried about Antonio. I am. Yeah. And, and I yeah, think Antonio fair. had a nice flash where he was excellent for a while. Yeah. That, you know, that, that, that kind of really started with the restart. Yeah, that's when they just became good. Yeah, right? like, absolutely. West Ham was like a relegation team. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> prior to and, the pandemic, and then Mikel Antonio and Jared Bowen just like went nuclear, and Declan Rice became one of the best midfielders in the league in the world, in yeah. my opinion. And all of a sudden, they're like, "Oh, you know, we we're really good now." And then you look at it. Okay, Mikel Antonio finished with two and a half shots per ninety last year, but the trend line was significantly down. Yeah, and. I don't know if they get enough from Bowen to make up for that. That's really the biggest question mark. They is, really can, need a forward, huh? They, they really do. And, no one. and they're very, I mean, we have heard nothing from West Ham. Yeah. And I think, you know, losing Rice would have been really bad, but, and, I, and they're still going to sell him probably next year. Next year, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how they reinvest that will be a huge, huge, you know, question mark because yeah. they need to go get a big name forward. I mean, Sebastian Allaire is going to go to Bayern, maybe, right? <laughs> I know. Like they had him. They had Allaire. They know. had Allaire, and because he had a bad year in the Prem when he was really young, they they moved on from him. And Mikel Antonio, you know, he finished with ten goals last year, but again, he was he was under 0. 0.4 xG per ninety. And like I said, the trend line was bad. I mean, look at the end of the season. And I'm not yeah. a big like end of the season is super predictive for the beginning of next year. I think it's yeah, a little yeah. too narrativey. But West Ham wasn't good, not from the end of the season, but from November on. Yeah. December on. Pretty much, they I feel like once Europe, draws. Europe came into play, they just, you know, fell off in the prem. They just, like, everyone was getting hurt, everyone was getting suspended, Antonio's legs fell off. It was just, yeah, yeah they got, bad. They, they ran really well to finish seventh. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There really okay. wasn't, like, a team okay. ready to usurp them. Yeah. But I'm I'm a seller of West Ham. I'm, I'm, okay. You know, when we when we get into our pod stuff, talking about, like, teams we're buying and selling, I am I'm selling West Ham. No, I mean, we'll still be in Europe, by the way. Yeah, and, yeah. And 
has a tricky haven't really squad depth issue. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I love hearing all this stuff because I like gambling is the ultimate like objectivity thing, you know, when you're putting your money down. So it's good to hear, you know, and I can I can apply a lot of this to, you know, FPL and stuff like that. But um, let's talk relegation. I mean, my first instinct, I just opened the relegation on odds and I'm like every year. Shouldn't I just bet the promoted teams? Like, I feel like two two thirds of the promoted teams probably go down, like right back down, you know? Um, so, you know, so they're there. You know, obviously Bournemouth's favorite, then Forrest and Fulham's at plus money. Um, you know, and then there's kind of a lot of teams in the mix. I feel like they're telling us that like, yeah, one of these teams might go down along with, you know, probably two-ish of the promoted sides. So it's Leeds plus 200, Brentford plus 275, Everton, which I like, plus 350, Southampton plus 350, Wolves 550. What do you like there? You know, I have not seen a to stay up market at this point, but I want Fulham. If they're offering plus 120 to stay up or to get relegated, I, I want like a minus, I'll take a minus 140 that they stay up. Really? You're high yeah, I'm in. Yeah, I'm in on Fulham. I mean, Let's Why? go back to two years ago when they got relegated. They were, they were good. 12th in XG difference. They were not a bad team. No, they were good. Yeah. They just ran really poorly. And every once in a while, that happens for a team. Fulham, we know, is one of the 20 biggest clubs in England. Their squad value is higher than a couple of the teams in this league. Brentford included. Leeds included. And so they have pieces that have performed at the Prem level before. They yeah. have experience being in the Prem very recently. They're not Norwich where they're just de- destined to be a yo-yo club. I don't <laughs> truly believe that with Fulham. And again, like I said, in 2020, 2021, they were not one of the three worst teams. They just got unlucky. They didn't finish their chances and they got relegated and that happens. But I don't think that, I think the narrative is uh, Fulham, you know, they, they ran through the championship, but they're going to do what Norwich did and just go right back down. I don't see it. I think Fulham's I, got enough. And I don't love Marco Silva. I don't either. Yeah. I admittedly do not either. Yeah. But I I do think that they are definitely, you know, if we have to bet one team to stay up, I think uh, it's definitely them. Now, I do like what Forrest did getting Taiwa. I think that I think that was a good ad. But I mean, they, their XG difference in the championship suggests that they were pretty fortunate to come up to begin with. And so anytime a team is running about even in the championship or slightly above <laughs> even in the championship. Not a you good know, time. kind of like a Huddersfield town kind of vibes from, yeah, from a few yeah, years yeah. ago. And they managed to barely stay up that year. And then they went horribly down the next year. You can get a lot of variance in this, but I, I do think Forrest is pretty doomed. And and Bournemouth, I have to look deeper into Bournemouth, to be honest with you. Their numbers were fine in the championship. I know. I was surprised that they're the favorites. I was really surprised I to see that. Forrest I feel like to be the favorite. Yeah, me too. And Scott Parker and, and, uh, was the manager of that good Fulham team. You know, he's actually he actually has premier league experience where he managed a bad team made them better and and you know they played well at a high level so i'm like i I was pretty surprised to see that yeah and the interesting thing about fulham or excuse me about bournemouth is i don't think they're the worst team i haven't seen i i'm I'm on DraftKings now i don't see a to finish bottom market but i'll be betting for us to finish bottom Mm. like i said i like taiwo his numbers were solid in the bundesliga but not good enough to the point where when you put the tax on him, and yes, the Bundesliga tax is real. People joke about it, but like it is real. <laughs> if you put the tax on him, his numbers in the Prem don't really suggest that he's going to make a huge difference. That means, like we saw with Vegarst, right? He was getting like yeah. two and a half, three shots per 90 at Wolfsburg. Yeah. And he came to the Prem and he was getting like 1.1 1. 1 shots yeah. per match. Yeah. And like that's not going to cut it. Not and I don't really it. know that Taiwo does enough for me. So Right. I don't you know, know if I love Forrest him. Like, I can loved, get him the ball, you know? Right, right. And I and I love him as a player. I, I love betting on Union in the Bundesliga for, for the last couple of years, but uh, they are definitely up against it in terms of that. So, so I, I, I would say I would say I think Bournemouth and, and Forrest will go down. I'm not laying minus 155 on Bournemouth. Um, if, if Forrest got to even money, I'd bet it. But, I mean, is there a Fulham top promoted team? Of course, we're still pretty far out. But yeah, we're pretty far out, team. and there's so many different apps and stuff. I'm sure, I'm right. sure you could find it somewhere. But I was going to ask if you like Fulham to stay up, what's the prem team that you like most to get dragged in? You know, I don't Leeds, know what to make of Leeds. Me. I don't know what to make of Leeds because I do think they got better under Marsh, but then yeah. they lose Phillips. Yeah. And that's a big loss. I mean, their numbers, their on-off numbers with Phillips last year were horrendous. I mean, they and, were... And they're going to lose Rafinha. Right. And 
have they really replaced Rafinha's ball progression? Aronson's a good presser, but like not going to do the kind of ball progression I think in the prem at this age. He's not really ready for that. Uh, and Tyler Adams is a fine holding midfielder, I think, when he plays. He's got health issues. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think Leeds is very clearly the 18th best team in the league for mm, me. Mm. Uh, when I look at it, I've wow. got Fulham better. I, I think Brentford's in danger too. And we saw this last year with Leeds. And my biggest bet of the season last year was Leeds under points coming into the year because I said, look, they ran really well defensively. And the attack performed at a level I didn't think they could sustain given the BLs of burnout potential and the second year syndrome that happens. At some point, the gravity of Brentford being the poorest club in the league in terms of money and, and squad value being down there, that ultimately has pull. And I think they're a very good sell high this year. Mm. Now, the numbers were good. And, and the, the relegation number is not good enough to bet. Plus 275 is not good. I thought I'd get like five, six to one. Yeah. And then I'd be in, you know. Well, I guess like they, they slid late season, so that probably they, like they hurt your did, number. But, I mean, they did. Yeah, I mean, they did slip a little bit late. They did. Um, they did. They. they I guess it were, was more uh, mid season. Then they kind right. of picked it back up when they got. They Eric were closer and, to right. top ten than relegation for yeah. most of the season, yeah. though. And so I thought I'd get like a four or five to one, five to six yeah. to one, and then I'd fire on them. But yeah, plus two seventy five. There's there's not a ton of value. I think the market is clearly pricing it. What I just said with you know the fact is. The, the odds are stacked against you. And I love Thomas Frank and I love Brentford. They lose Erickson. That is a loss. And you just kind of wonder, like, how long can the defense actually be a top six, seven, eight unit, which they were right. last year. But then you look at the players and you look at the system, you're like, it doesn't really add up. So I think right. Brentford is going to concede a lot more goals this year. Yeah. I mean, the now, thing for me also when you're making the leads comparison, just to butt in for a sec, is like leads come in, they finish ninth. Amazing. But everyone stayed fit that none of the key players got injured in their in their first season. And then what happens next season? Bamford barely plays. Calvin Phillips misses major minutes. You know, they have other injuries in the back line. And, you know, they're a disaster. They almost get relegated. And I feel like Brentford is, like, sort of similar. Like, they tick a lot of those boxes, right? Tony plays 3,000 minutes. You know, most of the back line played 3,000 minutes or more. You know, Raya missed time, but not that much. He still played 2,000 minutes. You know, a lot of the key figures stayed fit basically all season and can they do that again i mean it's basically right, that's luck. the question <laughs> yeah yeah I, and you know brentford doesn't play like a leedsian style where you're like running a, yeah, a team yeah. to death but again you mentioned it like betting teams that didn't get injured last year to get injured this year is a generally good bet yeah and you're going to be wrong right more than you're wrong with that yeah. so yeah, yeah yeah there's a lot of questions about brentford i'll be selling the bees generally speaking i think the market Kind of, but but again, it's all relative to the market, right? Like yeah. relative to last season, I think Brentford is worse, but the market thinks that too. And so yeah. you have to kind of realize like, okay, you're not just betting against what happened. You're betting against what the market says will happen next. And I think that's one mm. thing that I struggle with sometimes. And yeah. you know, you're like, oh, this team's running hot. I really want to fade them like wolves. But then the market was pricing wolves. They yeah. were a home underdog to Aston Villa. But the market <laughs> was, was very aware they that knew. wolves stunk. Like, so like, you kind of have to parse that out a little bit. Right, right, right. Man. And, and, right. and in the case of Brentford, there just isn't, like, the market is not showing it. I mean, the market has them 16th. I've got them better than that. I've got them 15th. Uh, and I had them 13th at the end of the last season. So, right. like, you know, there's not really like a, oh, Brentford's super high value. So, <laughs> What about Everton? Do they get dragged in again or are they just, you know, too good? I mean, they're, they lost Richarlison. They added... Tarkovsky, sure, but like, you know, I'm not sure they're better and I don't like Lampard. Yeah, I mean, the thing is with Everton, it's kind of the anti-Brentford, right? Like everything that you know about Everton makes you think that they should be in the Prem comfortably and they'll probably be fine. And their XG numbers suggest that they did get better defensively under Lampard in yeah. the second, you know, it was like he came in, they had that game against Spurs where they got embarrassed and they had another game where they got embarrassed and then they started to play better. And yeah. I think with 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 Everton, the defense will be fine. Healthy Calvert Lewin is kind of the biggest question mark, right? Uh, DCL has not been able to stay healthy. Probably has cost him a move from the club. But if they can keep him healthy, he's good, and that makes a yeah. big difference. Now, and yeah. how do they spend the Rashalison money? 
Yeah, we'll see. We don't. Are they going to spend it? Do they have the money? Can they spend it? Or are they in so much debt that that just covers debt? I think so, it might be the latter. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the thing. So yeah. I I'm kind of where the market is on Everton as well. I, I've got them. Uh, I've got them 14th, and the market has them to get relegated as 14th. So, um, not value, but just yeah, yeah. not value. Just in a, kind of a wait and see situation with them. I don't think they're a top half team by any stretch. But right. I also think they're probably just comfortably mid-table, which is what I said last year. It's funny because the beginning of last season, I, I did my power ratings, uh, and I had Everton, I think, 11th. And people were like, oh, why, why are you so... Or 12th. People were like, oh, why are you so low on Everton? This was like a month into the season. Yeah, I released yeah. them again. I said, I've still got them 12th. People were like, oh, why are you so low on Everton? Why are you so high on Arsenal? And I was like, well, like, Everton kind of isn't that good and yeah. then it, it almost flipped because then i posted it in like march and people were like oh you've got everton you know 14th 15th i'm like well yeah like they're not that bad they're just yeah i don't know i don't think everton changed that much yeah, yeah. Over the course i, of the I season. don't think so i kind of just think they're statically returns and losses it is a big one low-key really big for them though you know like that yeah. when they worked it was all retardless and dcl yeah. just sort of doing all the work so yeah, we'll see. We'll see about that. Um, and, and again, that's the situation where, like, if, if we get to August 5th and they have not replaced Richarlison, we may have yeah. a different conversation. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I just don't know what that's going to look like. All I don't right, even I'll, know who I'll, they I'll would I'll tune into up. Wonder Goal. I'm, I'm sure you guys are doing a Futures episode, right? You have to. Yeah, we're going to we're gonna do uh, we're gonna do a Premier League preview. We're going to do a European preview. And then I think we're going to do a point total draft. Oh my gonna, God, gonna, I uh, love and that. I, I thought it was a good idea. We don't have the market up for it yet, but it, once they release the market for all 20 teams, we're all going to draft one by one over-unders. not saying I'm betting everyone, but for something fun to track about the yeah. season, oh, uh, mean, we can kind of make phenomenal. it work. So I yeah, think that's I what we're going to do as well. Yeah, so I might copy you and do that with, it, with uh, my friends. Should. Yeah, yeah, it sounds fun. Um, I have a bunch more questions, but honestly... I feel satisfied with the future stuff. And, you know, if you want to learn more about betting, whatnot, check out Wonder Goal. Um, you know, thanks so much for coming on, man. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? Where can people read your work, hear you talk, check out Wonder Goal, all that stuff? Yes, yeah, so you can follow all my bets in the Action Network app, the award-winning Action Network app. Uh, I put all my soccer bets in there. I bet baseball this time of year. I bet college hoops when that comes around. But soccer uh, from August to May. And... We'll be betting the World Cup too. Uh, I bet that year round. We have a twice a week podcast. Comes out on Thursdays and Mondays. We do weekend preview, and then we do when there's you know Champions League or whatever midweek previews on Mondays. Uh, we we break down almost every game in the Prem. It gets played all season, and then we'll touch on our favorites from across Europe. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Anthony Debundo. That's uh, Anthony D A B B U N D O, and you can read my work on baseball, college, and and soccer on the Action Network website. So. Uh, really excited for the new season. We are just planning our recording dates for when we're going to do our season previews. It's going to be kind of weird too because it's just always in flux with the... I hate that the transfer window continues beyond the start of the season. It's, it's really just stupid. a bad job. Yeah. It's terrible because you're like, oh, you know, we lost our first two games. Let's go spend a bunch of money or... Right. You know, you think one thing about a team and then they go buy a great player and you're like, okay, well, never mind. Yeah. So I don't love that, but we're going to get into it. It'll be a lot of fun. I am still formulating my own thoughts. Kind of, <laughs> this was this was a good way for me to kind of start to put together it's what a I warm think. Up. Right, it's like a warm up in a way, uh, and and really the first time that I put a lot of thought into the new season. So thank you for having me on. It was, it was a pleasure, dude. Anytime, we'll talk soon.